Tonight, she will present her program, Andy Warhol's 15 Minutes of Fame. Pop artist Andy Warhol famously elevated everyday objects like soup cans to works of fine art. His paintings, silk screens, and photography often focused on American consumerism, not just of products, but of celebrities and images themselves. This program will look at the abbreviated life, artwork, and enduring, leg enduring legacy of the artists who predicted in the future, everyone will be word world famous for 15 minutes. Has your 15 minutes occurred yet? Um, so with that, I will turn it over. I do want to ask anyone who has any questions during the program, please direct those to the chat. Um, and Jane will ask periodically if you have questions and we might be able to ask them. Otherwise, we will definitely try to get to them at the end of the program. So thank you so much, Jane, for joining us tonight. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Jess. And I feel like my 15 minutes are just beginning right now. <laughs> Hopefully I can extend it to a full hour. <laughs> so thank you everybody for joining us this evening. This should be a lot of fun looking at Andy Warhol's work. He was um, a real boundary breaker in the world of art and he is sort of considered the ultimate um, pop art icon. I mean, he, he, um, he, he broke these boundaries. He was working in a variety of media, but I think most often we associate him with silk screens, but he worked in film. He was producing music and theater. Um, he had his fingers in so many different projects. For tonight's program, I've really sort of narrowed it down or else, I mean, we could spend months looking at everything that he did. So we're going to be prioritizing his, um, really the groundbreaking work that he did in the 1960s and, um, and the two dimensional work at that. So, um, but there's plenty to consider along with in all of that. And I think just to give you a sense in terms of how important Andy Warhol is to the world of art, generally speaking, um, after Pablo Picasso, he's considered essentially the most important artist of the 20th century, generally speaking. Um, it wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't be talking out of turn to put him into that category. So let me give you the lay of the land and how we're going to move through uh, the, the information tonight. And here's our artist right in front of us, Andy Warhol, standing in front of some of his iconic works. And I've broken up these sections tonight, sort of gave them fun little names based on how Andy approached art, because for him, everything was um, about business and money and celebrity, <laughs> and of course, making art. So his early years, I've called his template, and that is certainly where we'll see this imprint of, um, of interests that he maintains throughout his career. Then we see him launch as a commercial illustrator, and then he begins to brand. He becomes interested in things like uh, Coca-Cola, and he starts starts to uh, essentially brand himself. We'll look at the factory, which was his uh, artist studio and how that sort of functioned differently than most artist studios. We'll consider his work in, um, in terms of his fascination with celebrity, his depictions of celebrity. We'll look at how he approached death in his work and even his near death experience. And then we'll wrap up with his legacy. So plenty to cover here and we'll just dive right in. Thinking about the template, which is of course his early years. So Andy Warhol was born Andrew Warhol in 1928. He was uh, the last of three boys uh, and he was a first generation American. His parents had immigrated from what is essentially present day Slovakia. So this is young Andy Warhol, Andrew Warhol, uh, at about the age of four with his mother and one of his brothers. They lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They were very much a working class family and they were also very devout Catholics. They actually moved neighborhoods so that they could attend a specific church, which was um, a Byzantine Catholic church. And this is the actual altar of the church that he attended. They would go there multiple times a week. So it's really interesting to think about young Andy Warhol absorbing this kind of imagery uh, from an early age. When he was about eight years old, he, uh, he uh, came down with a neurological condition called chorea, which kept him out of school uh, quite a bit uh, around that time. And it's a neurological disease that uh, can sort of cause involuntary movements of the limbs and, and sometimes um, some redness on the face. So he was about this age when, when he um, contracted that and was suffering from that. 
So he'd stay home in bed and his mother would give him Hollywood magazines. Uh, he was really fascinated with pictures of Shirley Temple. He'd play with little paper cutouts and his parents begin to see in him and nurture in him uh, his love of art. And even at the age of eight, they bought him a camera, which if you think about this, I mean, he was growing up in the Great Depression. So that's pretty extraordinary. His father died when he was just 13 years old from an accident, but Andy and his and his mother remained very, very close. The photo on the right was taken just the day before he went off to college in 1945, and he attended the Carnegie Institute of Technology, which is now Carnegie Mellon University. While he was there, he served as the art director for the student art magazine. And these are two of his two examples of like his student work. And what I see when I look at these works is a young man who's been exposed to European modernism. You know, I, I think he did, he created an interior like the one on the left, probably thinking of like Van Gogh or something like that. Um, and then the image on the right, uh, these abstracted forms are, are certainly uh, sort of popular for the for the first half of the 20th century. The image on the right also reminds me that he was playing with paper cutouts when he was a little boy, but he called this one, I like dance. And he was actually a member of the modern dance club when he was at college. So he earned a bachelor's degree in fine arts and pictorial design and in 1949, and he's ready to take on the world. So let's consider what his launch looked like. After he graduates that same year, he moves to New York City to pursue a career as a commercial artist. So let's take a look at how he markets his work and how he markets himself. Now, I just think of New York City as this huge city for anybody to be a success in New York is a remarkable thing to me. And the very year he graduated from college, he began to get uh, illustration and design gigs with major magazines. He did this design, he did this illustration here, in 1949, the year he graduated. And, you know, how appropriate to success is a job in New York City. It's like he has arrived and he's do, and he's created this sweet little fanciful uh, drawing here of this woman who's climbed the ladder. She's perched way up above the city and she's smoking a cigarette, you know, total success. And so uh, he, we know that Andy Warhol was creating these kind of fun, fanciful, charming images and they became really popular. Um, so his graphic work would sometimes include labels and references to products like, like what you see here. This is actually from 1962. But his 1950s work, for the most part, looked a lot like this. And this was a style that got him um, a lot of attention, earned him a lot of money, and, and, and essentially a, a great deal of success in the 1950s. This style here is known as a blotted ink drawing. And essentially it's a rudimentary form of printmaking where you would draw in pen and ink or draw in ink on a shiny piece of paper and then press that shiny piece to um, a flat piece of paper. So this is um, a, an image that's been transferred from one page to the next which is how you get this kind of blotted line element to it that that was really attractive to a lot of magazines and and um and businesses at this time so his work was in demand he was winning awards he was working not only for um, major magazines this was in vogue actually in um, 1957 but he was also working for tiffany and company and columbia records people loved what he was doing he was also designing shoes in the 1950s for Israel Miller. And so I just love this spread. This is um, a two page spread that I think was um, in Harper's Bazaar in 1958. I love how long and skinny these shoes. I, apparently he just kept making the shoes longer and longer and skinnier and skinnier. Israel Miller was totally pleased though because he said Andy Warhol always put the buckle in the right place. So apparently Andy Warhol, I should mention too, he changed, he dropped the A from his last name, Warhola, once he moves to New York um, and he's launching himself in a new way. So Andy Warhol becomes really proud of this kind of work and he begins to sort of fantasize about making this leap 
from the com from commercial illustration to the world of fine art. So what we're looking at here is an example of what he might have submitted to the Museum of Modern Art. We know he submitted uh, an illustration of a shoe for consideration in um, for entry into their permanent collection. And on the right here, we have his rejection letter. Everybody, you know, struggles to, to find fame, even Andy Warhol to a certain degree, or at least in making the sleep into the realm of fine art. I mean, can you imagine the PS down here? You can come and pick up your work at, at the museum at your convenience. So, so this was the type of thing that he was doing and maybe the, the world of fine art just wasn't quite ready for it. But we see at this time still, um, the beginnings of ideas that would sort of carry with him throughout his career. What we're looking at here are hand-colored illustrations for um, for some self-published self-published books that he created in the 1950s. Uh, he, as I said, he remained really close with his mother. And two years after he moved to New York City, she actually moved in with him, and they lived together uh, essentially through the rest of uh, his life. They even collaborated. They loved cats apparently they had 25 of them that's really hard for me to imagine in a New York City apartment um, but his mother would oftentimes do the text and the script in his illustrations and in his self-published books and I think what's really important to know um, about these self-published books is that uh, in order to you know add this value to them they were hand colored and Andy Warhol was already thinking um, like a machine at this point in his career, because instead of doing all that work himself, he would gather up his friends at this cafe called Serendipity, and he would essentially create like a factory line of his friends, an assembly line for these hand-colored books, and put his friends to work doing um, the, the, the color for his self-published books. And of course, Serendipity might be a cafe that you've heard of before. There's a whole movie called Serendipity. Um, actually, several movies take place here and Marilyn Monroe was said to frequent quite a bit. So just to give you a sense in terms of what Andy Warhol looked like at this point in his career, you know, he's a young man making his way in New York City. He was a little bit of a fop. <laughs> he was a little slovenly, um, a little frumpled. Um, he uh, almost like a dandy in some ways. So, um, so he was just zigzagging all over the city, uh, dropping off work, meeting new clients. He was really busy, um, but he was also, uh, like I said, a little bit frumpled. He even told a story around this time or uh, of, of an event from around this time where he went and met with an editor at Harper's Bazaar opened up his portfolio and a cockroach crawled out of it. And so, and he said that the editor probably felt so bad for him, that's why he got the job. But he was said to have um, dropped off his work in these old portfolios and sometimes just in like crumpled up brown paper bags. So he hadn't quite developed um, his signature look <laughs> in the 1950s. So he was finding this success with illustration. And again, he tried to make this leap from the, from the world of commercial art to the world of fine art. And so he had a gallery exhibit of his illustrations and they were kind of homoerotic in nature. Andy Warhol was an openly gay man and this was way before the gay liberation movement. And uh, the world in many ways was just not ready for him at this time. I don't even believe he sold anything from that show. Just to give you a sense and a, or a reminder of what was popular at this time, it was abstract expressionism. It was um, artists like Jackson Pollock, who you see on the left, this was all the rage. And this was associated with uh, a real sort of masculine vigor to it. I mean, uh, abstract expressionism was even called action painting. These were like action stars. And here's Jackson Pollock, this tough guy, like a cowboy smoking a cigarette as he's you know, throwing paint at the canvas. And then you have Andy Warhol over here on the right, who's like cuddling up with kittens and, and drawing pictures of you know his boyfriends, which, didn't necessarily fly with audiences. So that brings us to the 1960s. And the 1960s are a critical time for Andy Warhol. And we'll see, this is when he becomes very interested in the branding of products. And he is able to brand himself and, um, and create this iconic look that travels with him through the next quarter century of his life and his career. 
So just to give you a sense in terms of how Andy Warhol arrives at his sort of artistic epiphany in the early 1960s, I brought in these three images. And, um, and I think it's important to just note right off the bat that Andy Warhol did not invent pop art. It was a movement that had already started in Great Britain. And, but I mean, he, we can easily credit him for um, making it explode in, in the United States. So these three works are, were done over uh, 1961, 1962. And the first one is on the left, the last one is on the right. So you can see in the first one, he's kind of playing around with this idea of including um, a commercial product in what would otherwise be sort of considered almost like an abstract expressionist work that we have all this gesture, we have this sense of, you know, something that's kind of unfinished and very expressionist. And so he's kind of combining these pop elements with an abstract expressionist painting. He had a friend that came and visited him and said, you know, you're sort of locking into something here, but take away, take away the, these sort of abstracted elements here, focus on the Coke bottle. So our next image is a six foot tall canvas with a very crisp, clear delineated Coca-Cola bottle with the Coca-Cola label here. I mean, for all intents and purposes, it just looks like a Coke advertisement, right? Um, it doesn't even look like you have the hand of the artist involved in this process at all. And then by 1962, we have the green Coca-Cola bottles, which are um, screen printed on. And you can see there's a huge variety in terms of the result of those prints. Some of the images are almost totally obscured, but no matter, we see, we, we understand and we can recognize the shape of that bottle because of course, Coca-Cola is ubiquitous. And Andy Warhol said that that was kind of part of the reason why he, he was interested in depicting it. He, um, he, he liked the idea that no matter who you were, if you were the president of the United States or if you were you know essentially a homeless man, if you bought a bottle of Coke, it would be the same bottle of Coke, no matter who you were. So if this sort of feels a little bit like intellectual trickery here or art, art um, making trickery here, uh, you're not alone. It's okay to be skeptical about what he's doing. It's okay to say, well, how is this different from advertising? And I'll just give you a, like a, a really sort of brief point of reference for what he's doing. Earlier in the 20th century, you have the artist Marcel Duchamp, who introduces uh, uh, this work that we see here, which he called Fountain. And he signs a fake name to it and he puts it on display in a gallery. But what we're looking at here is, um, is a urinal. It's something that he just found. <laughs> he decided to represent it within an art context. And, um, and, he, and he broke boundaries in the sense that uh, he, he decided that art didn't have to be something that you make, something that, um, something that you design. Art can just be the idea. And, and Andy Warhol is sort of standing on Marcel Duchamp's shoulders in order to create works like the Coke bottles. And um, not surprisingly, Andy Warhol would go on to collect work by Marcel Duchamp. He was really interested in, um, in his ideas. So that brings us to his very famous Campbell soup cans. So these are from 1962. They're in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. When they were originally displayed in a gallery in LA, they were just um, one single line of soup cans that stretched around the room. And here they're sort of stacked almost as though they're on um, like grocery store shelves. We've got 32 soup cans here uh, that look almost identical, but you'll notice that they're all different flavors. And there are 32 of them because that's how many flavors were available at the time. So Andy Warhol made these in a very system systematic way. He, um, he, it was a multi-step process where he would um, project the image of this Campbell soup cans, essentially trace it, do some hand painting, and then do uh, a, a stamped Fleur de Lis at the bottom. He just decided that he didn't want to keep painting that. So, um, so he does that and he does it 32 times. Andy Warhol once famously quipped, 
I want to be a machine. There was something about um, how precise these were that really um, interested him. And of course, he's pushing his audience to start thinking about consumerism and, um, and the marketplace. And, and he's presenting something that we literally consume too. And how appropriate, because I mean, this was a man, a young man who grew up in the scarcity of the Great Depression. And now it's, you know, it's the early 1960s and America could not be more different. The grocery stores are filled. <laughs> there's more options than, than one could almost even fathom. And there's something about all of all the abundance of, um, of what is available in the marketplace that is really interesting to Andy Warhol. And of course, you can't discount the fact that he was a commercial illustrator himself. So there's all these things sort of playing into it. But I think it's important to note too, that this is so different from what came before it. I mean, this this is a world away from Jackson Pollock and those and those action paintings. Uh, there's nothing expressionistic here. There's nothing that really. Um, it, they're not especially beautiful. I mean, they just look like commercial products. I don't think anybody has ever stood in front of Andy Warhol's soup cans and has been moved to tears by their beauty. They're, um, it's, it's Andy Warhol pushing boundaries in terms of what could be considered art. This is just a reminder of how young he was when he was creating works like this. So as these works um, travel across the country and, um, and Andy Warhol goes from um, exhibiting them in LA to exhibiting them and selling them in, in New York, there's a symposium on pop art at the Museum of Modern Art. And um, Andy Warhol was attacked at that time for capitulating to the market. Um, people were scandalized that he was just embracing capitalism the way he was. So he was, I mean, this was considered transgressive at the time and he wouldn't really explain what he was doing. He had this kind of Keaton-esque uh, mysterious way of, of answering questions or dealing with the press. People would ask him, you know, is this about, uh, you know, whatever, is this about uh, uh, capitalism? And he would say, um, Yes, or I, I suppose, or he, he was not a, a man of many words. So, so we, um, he, uh, we do know though, at one point he did admit that he, he um, ate Campbell's soup every day for lunch for about 20 years. And, and that uh, could have been at the root of this, but of course these works are understood to be about so much more. So he returns to the soup cans uh, over the course of time as well and, and reinterprets them in different ways. I love the image on the left, which is the torn, uh, the small torn Campbell soup can. He takes all that perfection that he established in the 32 uh, soup cans and he kind of tears it up and it looks like a rejected can that you would find at the grocery store. And then the image on the right is the same subject, of course, but it's with these really bright garish colors that we associate later with his um, celebrity portraits. In 2012, Target stores actually um, issued these commemorative Campbell soup cans to honor Andy Warhol's work, uh, complete with uh, the artist's portrait on the back and his uh, facsimile of his signature. I wish I had known that, that they had done this. And I, I would say that I think Andy Warhol would have been thrilled with the fact that his, um, his images were being mass produced and that they <laughs> mass consumed even too. So um, from the soup cans, Andy Warhol expanded to three dimensions and that brought him to the Brillo pads. So of course he's on a theme here. He's, um, he's recreating household objects that you would find in grocery stores. And essentially his Brillo boxes looked exactly like what you would see in a grocery store. But instead of being a cardboard box, he made it out of ply, plywood and he had essentially like a stencil that he that was painted with, with house paint. And, and he would stack them up in the galleries, like you see here, in the exact same way they were stacked up in a grocery store. So, um, so he's really just kind of expanding upon that same idea that he had with the soup cans. All right, so at this time, Andy Warhol begins to 
uh, create a persona for himself, a branded persona that, um, that instantly becomes sort of recognizable. The 1950s version of Andy Warhol was known as Raggedy Andy. <laughs> the 1960s version becomes, you know, cool Andy. And he even talked about, you know, when I go out, I have to put on my Andy suit. He, um, he stops wearing these sort of rumpled suits and he's got this, you know, sort of sleek, cool black um, leather jackets and a, and a lot of black clothing. The glasses and he begins to start wearing wigs as well. He was sort of uh, balding prematurely and he was very self-conscious about that. So we have um, the Andy suit and, and the adoption of this kind of new cool, which makes um, dressing up as Andy Warhol a very simple Halloween out, uh, <laughs> option for people too. It's just like a black turtleneck, glasses and a wig. But if you think about it today, I mean, a simple black outfit, is like what Steve Jobs did. It's what Elizabeth Warren does. It's um, for a lot of people that we consider to be, um, you know, great thinkers and really innovative thinkers. They sort of pare down their wardrobe and it becomes, you know, sort of iconic. All right, so we have Andy Warhol as the brand. And once you've launched your brand, it's time to make a lot of money. So. This is Andy Warhol bringing his production to scale in the factory. That's what he called his studio. And Andy Warhol once said, being good in business is the most fascinating kind of art. Making money is art and working is art and good business is the best art. So this is sort of a, a group of three, very similar to those Coke bottles that we saw before. Andy Warhol didn't just love money, he loved to paint it <laughs> and depict it. So, um, so we have the $1 bill on the left, that's from 1961. The middle work is $201 bills from 1962. And then the work on the right is dollar sign from 1982. So he's, he's going back to the subject of money again and again and again. And at first glance, this might just be sort of similar to his interest in soup cans. But there's another dimension to this too, because unlike these kind of cheap grocery store products, when Andy was painting and silk screening um, money in the 1960s, it's a direct reference to the value of these objects themselves. He's essentially painting his paycheck when he was creating these works. So this work here, which is known as um, Silver Certificate, a $1 bill from 1962, this actually sold for $32.8 million. It's hard to wrap your brain around that. Um, of course, this was after Andy Warhol's death, but these, but you know, his work was highly valued even during his lifetime. And I, once again, I think he would be really tickled by the prospect that anybody would pay that much for one of his $1 bills. So with a work like this, or with a series of works like this, um, I'm reminded of one of his quotes, and that was, I like money on the wall. Say you were going to buy a painting. I think you should take that money, tie it up, and hang it on the wall. Then when someone visited you, the first thing they would see is money on the wall. So when he's painting dollar signs and dollar bills to sell to wealthy people, he's literally, he's very aware of the fact that he's, he's just creating a status symbol for them. And so he pairs it down to why not just create the money that they're spending. Um, so all right, so where is he making all of this money? He's making it at the Silver Factory. And it was called the Silver Factory because you can see that it was covered in aluminum foil. Uh, and he, the factory I should mention too, was the name of his studio. And there were three different buildings over the course of about two decades that served as his factory. But we see him in the center there on, on his couch. Um, so this is where all of the creative work was happening, but it was also a gathering place. And this is a photograph of one of Andy Warhol's parties at the factory. I believe that this figure back here with the hair and the glasses is probably Andy Warhol here. Uh, 
it was a real fascinating mix of people that would gather at the factory. And um, it was bohemians, it was playwrights, musicians, intellectuals, drag queens, um, and then of course his wealthy patrons. And so he was bringing all of these people together and, and interesting things would always happen. Uh, his landlords were not big fans of his because there was a lot of, you know, wine glasses and beer bottles found around the building. But at the factory, you'd also have celebrities like Mick Jagger and Truman Capote and Bob Dylan stopping in. And um, Warhol would, for many of these cele celebrities, do what he called a screen test. And this is a still image from a screen test. Screen tests were rarely prearranged and it was essentially like an informal fo photo booth. Uh, so essentially like a, a chair and a camera, <laughs> a video camera that were set up at the silver factory. And Andy Warhol would ask you to do a screen test. And what you would do is you would sit in front of this camera, they'd turn it on and essentially walk away and just ask you to sit as still as possible looking into this camera. So essentially you're kind of confronting yourself and they'd let the camera run for about three minutes. And then the final work of the screen test was played back in slow motion. So it was like a, a 12 minute video in the end. Um, he did about 500 screen tests between 1964 and 1966. And, and you can get these kind of remarkable images from them. And this is of course, Edie Sedgwick. Uh, this, was, this is just a, a, a still from her screen test. And she was a, a model and an actress and she was very much a member of his clique she was in his inner orbit and she was one of the people in this um, inner orbit that he referred to as his superstars. Andy Warhol's even credited for inventing the term superstar. So at his factory, he was literally producing celebrities, <laughs> but he was also making artwork too. <laughs> so here he is with some studio assistants here making um, all sorts of, of um, prints of his famous flowers. And it's not unusual for art for artists to engage assistants in their in their studios. Artists have been doing this for centuries. Every major um, Renaissance artist you can think of had a studio, had a workshop, and their assistants did a lot of work, if not almost all of it. <laughs> so Andy Warhol's doing the same thing, but what he's doing by calling this the factory is that he is implying that all of this is done with a mechanized process and that the final product is sort of dehumanized. He's taking um, really the, the expression uh, out of creating works of art. But he did create works too. He was involved in this. So before you get too cynical, just know that he was actually an artist as well. But I think for the most part, it was his ideas that were serving as catalysts. Uh, and he was, you know, involved in, in editing and refining. The factory was a place where um, his ideas kind of blossomed. And, um, and so one of the things that he began to do at the factory was to uh, rope in some of his assistants and the superstars hanging around. And he started to do a lot of experimental film. This was one of his first films. It's simply called Sleep. It's from 1964. And it is a five hour film of his then boyfriend sleeping. Does that not sound boring? <laughs> well, it's the perfect precursor to today's reality television. If you ever indulge in watching reality TV, I guarantee you, you've watched people sit around eating cereal or sleeping or doing other really mundane things. In fact, that's part of the allure of going to a Zoom meeting, right? Is seeing other people doing really mundane things in their homes. So, you know, because of the pandemic, pandemic we all get our 15 minutes of fame. Andy Warhol, he actually dreamed of doing a television show about nothing, a la Seinfeld. And later in his career, he actually did have two shows on cable TV. One of them was on MTV and it was called Andy Warhol's 15 Minutes of Fame. And he was always kind of serving as, as a guest star on shows ranging from The Love Boat to Saturday Night Live. So experimental film was a, a big part of his artistic output. And he ended up doing about 150 films over the course of his career. 
In addition to film, he was branching out in a lot of other ways. Um, his this interest in art and business, you know, al allows for kind of um, ever expanding ideas. And so he, in, he began to publish books. He was producing shows, as I mentioned at the beginning, and he started this magazine called Interview Magazine. He co-founded it, and the magazine was devoted to film fashion, popular culture. We have the very first cover of Interview Magazine over here on the left, and then a later Polaroid of Andy Warhol himself reading the magazine. The magazine was uh, nicknamed the Crystal Ball of Pop, and it gave Andy Warhol a sort of a continued access to, to rich and famous people to connect with, to interview. So it was kind of a, um, a circular uh, or a cyclical <laughs> Uh, process of, of maintaining celebrity and uh, maintaining contacts with celebrity. And so it's very appropriate that even after Andy Warhol's death, Interview Magazine, which lived on, would then go on to feature Andy Warhol in drag on the cover. Uh, so this was, you know, almost a decade after he died, and they're referring to him as our pop and mom, Andy Warhol. So, um, so all of these things helped to boost him in terms of his celebrity and then helped to maintain and perpetuate it and connect him with other important and celebrated figures. So that brings us to this next segment here about celebrity, which is sort of inexplicable strictly linked to Andy Warhol's uh, artistic output. He said, my idea of a good picture is one that's in focus and on a famous person. So, um, and of course this, this connects us to the idea that he said, everybody in the future will be famous for 15 minutes. So for Andy Warhol, celebrity, his interest in celebrity sort of kicks off in terms of his fine art career with this image here, which is called the Gold Marilyn. It's from 1962. It was created just a few months after Marilyn Monroe's um, sort of untimely death that has been ruled a, a, a suicide. And so he created a number of tributes to her that year. And, and in this one, he takes a, sort of a publicity still of the, of the actress's face and he transfers that image uh, by way of screen printing onto this very large canvas, which he had already painted gold. And then he adds in these really sort of bright, sort of blinding to uh, garish colors to represent Marilyn's hair and eyeshadow and her skin and lips. So the effect here is just this um, beautiful face that is sort of roughly printed um, hanging in this field of gold. He's, he's sort of canonizing her by, um, by putting her in, in this field of gold. And, and, and he's literally creating an icon. And of course, that would probably remind you of that Byzantine Catholic church that he attended uh, while he was growing up. So, um, so this feels like a very fitting tribute to a celebrity who had passed away uh, that same year. And so he continues to kind of explore celebrity and status and, um, and iconic status with the Marilyn Diptych, which was done the same year, 1962. So here he's replicating his gold Marilyn again and again and again on one side of the diptych. On the other side, it's all in black and white. It's sort of like a, a ghostly shadow to the, um, the gold Marilyns on the left. And if you look closely, each one of these uh, images is printed differently. It has um, varying amounts of color to it. And, and it's a reminder, sort of like those Coke bottles, that no matter how it's printed, we recognize and understand that it's Marilyn Monroe. But we also begin to sort of see how um, printed again and again and again, um, that, th that the face almost appears kind of mask-like, that, um, that, that we can sort of connect with, with this sense of sadness that she might've been masking um, before her death. 
But Andy Warhol is also reminding us that her status as a celebrity, her recognize, uh, the, the ability to be recognized is uh, very similar to things like the Coke bottles that he, had, that he had done right around the same time. Her face was a product <laughs> to be consumed, um, very much like those consumer goods that he sort of launched his career with. But the celebrities and the interest in celebrities uh, takes us in a whole new way. I should mention this is when um, he becomes, he really begins to exploit the silk screening process. And he is um, not the inventor of silk screening, but he um, exploits it as an artistic medium, uh, as a fine art medium in a way that very few artists had done before. It, it's a process that had been around again for centuries. Uh, but he, um, he, he adopts it and he adopts the kind of misprints that you would see in commercial illustrations or in pulp illustrations, uh, not something that you would see in the fine art world. So here, 1964's uh, depiction of Liz Taylor, uh, just called Liz, uh, the, even the way he prints these red lips, they don't actually align with her lips here, but they accentuate um, her, her sort of most alluring qualities, her eyes, her lips. Uh, and again, uh, we've got this kind of flattened um, effect here, but it's uh, without a doubt recognizable as Liz Taylor. And so this process also allows you to print it in a variety of colors again and again and again. And here's Andy Warhol with Liz Taylor. Apparently he always sort of fawned over her and then they eventually became very good friends. So he's exploring celebrity culture and representing a lot of celebrities, particularly celebrities that were um, very successful in the 1950s. So here's his double Elvis, which is a life-size depiction of Elvis from um, a Western movie. This, he he um, did this one in 1963 and you can see he's uh, printed, he's, he's printed it twice, uh, slightly different poses, I believe. And, um, and, and the effect always reminds me of, um, you know, Elvis was famous for shaking his hips and you almost get the sense of movement from this, from this work of art. But when it was made in 1963, Elvis's star was already fading. And so what we see here in the photograph on the right is Andy Warhol with Bob Dylan, who had just stopped by the factory for his screen test. And Andy Warhol apparently gave this work to Bob Dylan as a gift for his time. So there's a whole new kind of counterculture and sense of celebrity that was on the rise in the 1960s. Um, and Andy Warhol seems to be able to um, capture and memorialize uh, celebrities from the previous decade, while also engaging artists uh, and, and sort of revolutionary artists from the 1960s. Andy Warhol also was fascinated with um, depictions of Chairman Mao. And in 1972, you have Richard Nixon uh, traveling to China to meet Chairman Mao and ending years of diplomatic isolation. And so um, the US uh, sort of newly understands how the cultural rev revolution resulted in the same image of Chairman Mao represented again and again throughout China. And so, um, so Andy Warhol becomes fascinated by the idea of political propaganda and capitalist advertising having this kind of distinct connection here. So he created a, a number of variations uh, on Mao's portrait. The 1970s, he's continuing on with his fascination of celebrity culture. This is, of course, Mick Jagger. Uh, we can see here that the screen print technique is sort of modified. It's more like um, a collage or kind of a block print feel. We have an undated photograph of Andy Warhol with Mick Jagger just kind of hanging out together over here on the right. Andy Warhol was even creating cover albums for the Rolling Stones. This image in particular uh, was created in 1971 and was nominated for a Grammy. This is around the time when Andy Warhol is frequenting Studio 54 and rubbing elbows with all these different celebrities, which again, sort of keeps him in the limelight and keeps him connected to potential celebrities for portraiture. This is his 1980 portrait of Debbie Harry. 
and a photograph of him taking a photograph of Debbie Harry. <laughs> I should mention there are two sort of um, veins in terms of how these works are understood. Some critics say that they're flat, they're facile, they don't tell you anything about the subject, that they're no good. And then other critics would say they perfectly capture the the tenor of the of that moment that they um, that this interest in celebrity culture and representing it in this way captures a slice of of American life and culture in a really sort of brilliant way. Now you can't talk about celebrity and. Um, without talking about Andy Warhol himself, because he managed to, uh, you know, as, I, as I've mentioned so far uh, several times, he managed to create his own celebrity and sustain it. So these are three self portraits by Andy Warhol. Um, on the left, we have a work from, a photograph from 1963. I love this photograph because it looks like somebody's selfie that could be on Instagram today. He just looks like a young hipster, right? And then we have an early 80s Polaroid of Andy Warhol dressed up in drag. I think it's so fascinating that he would sort of try on uh, different, um, different personas. And, and he was very conscious about kind of experimenting with, with his look. He was um, very self-conscious about his appearance. He got a nose job at one point. Uh, the chorea that he suffered from as a child um, really affected his skin. He was self-conscious about that. And of course his hair as well. So he was, um, uh, he adopted wearing these these iconic silver wigs, and we see that one really spiked up uh, in the image on the left, which was done in um, 1986. And uh, art historians particularly love this series from 1986 because it's just before his death. He looks very serious. He looks very gaunt. And art historians say that um, it's almost as though he, he's acknowledging and understanding his own death in these images. And that brings us to one of these last categories here, and that is death. Uh, because death was a subject that Andy Warhol was sort of fascinated with, and he has a very significant brush with death himself. So let's talk about how he engages with death as a subject matter. Right after his early success with um, commercial items like the soup cans and the Coke bottles, a curator friend of his recommended that he take on more serious subject matter if he wanted to be taken seriously as an artist. So from that, you get a series that Norman, that Norman, <laughs> that Andy Warhol called his Death and Disaster series. And what we're looking at here is called the Mustard Race Riot from 1963. One half of the picture is um, images from the media, from, from um, news magazines of a race riot or um, a, a civil rights protest, really. Uh, in Birmingham, Alabama. And then the other half is just painted the solid mustard color. Here's a, a better detail. You can see uh, the police and the dogs here and the violence. Um, so with this series, Andy Warhol is um, exploring all sorts of kind of dark subject matter. Um, the elements of American life that people didn't necessarily want to look at. We also have this series here, which he called the Lavender Disaster from 1963. And what we're looking at is a screen print of an electric chair replicated again and again and again. And the same year that he created it, there were two people who were put to death um, by electric chair, electric chair in New York, in, in New York. So it was something that was sort of on people's minds. I think it's significant that he has chosen to um, uh, chosen an image where it's an empty chamber here. And if you have really good eyes, you can see right over this door, it actually says silence too. So, um, so it, it's a darker subject matter, certainly a more serious subject matter. Uh, and then this is probably one of the quirkiest entries in the Death and Disaster series. Uh, this was called the Tuna Fish Disaster because there were two um, Detroit area housewives 
who were poisoned and died by um, uh, essentially bad tuna. <laughs> and so he has taken the images of the cans of tuna and the images of, of the women and replicated them again and again. This is almost like the marriage of um, his, his, um, his interest in, in commercial items and in death and disaster coming together here. And this leads us all to uh, images of Jackie Kennedy. And we, it, if you're familiar with Andy Warhol's work, you know he was fascinated by her just as much as he was fascinated by Marilyn Monroe. She was a tragic figure and she was sort of like the pinnacle of this interest in portraiture and celebrity and in disaster. So he was particularly interested in images of Jackie Kennedy from um, right before and right after the death of her husband. This is called Nine Jackies, and that's what these images represent. It's sort of a, a timeline of the whole event kind of coming together. You can almost think of this as functioning like a history painting in that way without actually showing the death of the president. So, um, so, so I think the, these images were particularly um, sort of fascinating for the general public at the time because they were widely reproduced and her emotional response to this, you know, uh, uh, horrific occurrence was, uh, was a, a type of emotion that people rarely saw in, in the news. And so there was this real interest in this beautiful woman um, having uh, this, this uh, real emotional reaction to this tragedy. So Andy Warhol, like everybody else, was, um, was, was tuning in and finding ways to appropriate these images for his artwork. So this leads us to Andy Warhol's own brush with death. And, um, and it was, it was a sort of a celebrity, celebrity sized scandal of its own. So uh, we're looking here at a, at a newspaper account of, of what happened. Essentially uh, an actress who was in his outer orbit at the factory, somebody he knew but didn't know well, came to the factory one day to pick up a script that she had left there. Andy Warhol was meeting with a curator at the time and she ended up shooting both of them. The curator was taken to the hospital, treated and released the same day. Andy Warhol was pretty much as close to death as you can get without dying. Um, in fact, the doctors who treated him at the hospital said he didn't have a pulse. And one of them just happened to open his eye, one of Andy Warhol's eyes, realized that it was responding to light. And so they continued to, um, to try and revive him. So Andy Warhol lives for 20 years after getting shot, but I think there are a lot of people that say, you know, this was uh, a major turning point in his life in so many ways. So uh, he, this, the bullet that shot him um, uh, pierced eight different organs. And this is, these are photographs taken the following year by Richard Avedon. And we can see, you know, these really dramatic scars on his torso. Andy Warhol had to um, wear this surgical corset for the rest of his life. He was really, you know, physically and emotionally scarred by what happened to him. And this is a really sort of dramatic picture of the scars coming up. If you don't want to see that, I'll just show it very quickly. Um, so this is a this is a, a painting that I've always just loved. It's from 1970, and the artist is a woman named Alice Neal, who painted this portrait of Andy Warhol. And I I love it because he's heartbreakingly vulnerable here. And as a man who we know was always really concerned about his appearance, I mean, he's just he's opened himself up to this really sort of fragile and delicate. Um, interpretation here. And, and I think it's, it's important for us to sort of keep in mind that after this event, after this shooting, he, um, he goes from being really sort of open and experimental to being pretty guarded in his, in his artwork. So let's turn our attention to sort of the end of his career and the end of his life and consider his legacy. Um, and, and, 
one of the the coolest things about Andy Warhol, I would say, is that even though he became more guarded after this near death experience, one of the one of the elements that really defines his career as an artist and as a business business person is an interest in supporting other artists. So in 1979, he and a friend actually fa- uh, co-found the New York Academy of Art, and then he became begins to almost sort of like adopt these younger artists. And in this photograph, we see the artists he, uh, Keith Haring and Jean-Michel Basquiat with him. Andy Warhol almost functioned like an Oprah. Like these are, these are my favorite things, you know, presenting people to the public to take note and take interest. Both of these young artists had sort of started off as street artists or graffiti artists. And Andy Warhol was just uh, another layer of credibility in their lives that got them um, a, a attention and success and fame and fortune um, that may not have happened without Andy Warhol's presence. And Andy Warhol, always very savvy in terms of perpetuating his own um, importance and his own celebrity, he was smart enough to collaborate with them. So this is one of his collaborations with the artist Basquiat. This is an installation that's at the Andy Warhol Museum in in Pittsburgh. Um, It's 10 heavy bags. (laughs) And appropriately, we've got like this uh, promotional video or promotional photo over here with Andy Warhol and Basquiat wearing these boxing gloves. But the heavy bags just have um, a depiction of Jesus sort of reinterpreted from Da Vinci's Last Supper. And on every single one of the bags is the word judge again and again and again. So you can read into that what you will. Um, but there's, you know, there's implied judgment and, um, and violence just in what the subject matter is. So Basquiat, if you didn't already know, uh, dies at a very young age in 1988. He dies at the age of 27. And the work that he produced in his short life has gone on to fetch it's not overstating this, <laughs> more than $100 million at auction. This work in particular um, from 1982 is the most expensive painting uh, uh, ever purchased that was created by an American artist. So um, being in Andy Warhol's orbit certainly, like I said, adds some credibility. So uh, Basquiat died at a young age and Andy Warhol dies uh, you know, before his time. So let's turn our attention to the end of Andy Warhol's life. And what we're looking at here is a screen printed skull uh, that Andy Warhol created in 1976 and a a photo of the artist from around the same time. Andy Warhol uh, passed away in 1987 and he was just 58 years old. Uh, he had just undergone what should have been a routine gallbladder surgery, but um, upon sort of closer consideration, there's a, a lot of ac- experts that uh, essentially allege due to his, um, you know, previous medical history and all the the um, trauma that his body had suffered from being shot, uh, that 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 gallbladder surgery uh, wouldn't have been routine, and that more care probably should have been taken. He died in his sleep, and his body was brought back to Pittsburgh. Yoko Ono spoke at his funeral and he was buried next to his parents just outside of the city. So since his death, (laughs) um, a, a number of incredible things have come about. His entire estate was auctioned off and he was um, a collector sort of bordering on uh, a hoarder. He had all sorts of things. It took nine days to actually auction off his entire estate. And um, and what the results, all, all of the money that was raised from that auction went on to create the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts. That, that began in 1987. And it still remains one of the largest grant giving organizations organizations in the visual arts today. The Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts also gave 3,000 works um, to help establish the Andy Warhol Museum, which is, uh, we see here the exterior and interior shots. And this is in his hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It is the largest single artist museum in America. And it's one of the most comprehensive single artist museums in the entire world. It's uh, pretty exceptional. Andy Warhol's 
work still uh, really <laughs> sells <laughs> at, at auction. In fact, he is sort of considered the bellwether of the entire art market. If his work is selling well, then you know, auctions go well. What we're looking at here is another work from his disaster series. I love this picture because with the heads here, you get a sense of how big it is. This is called the Silver Car Crash Double Disaster. It's from 1963. It's the, um, this work was the, his most expensive work ever to sell at auction. And he just, Basquiat just beats him out. This one sold for $105 million. It's so hard to wrap my, my mind around how much money that is. Um, he was just 35 years old when he created this work of art. So Andy Warhol, when we think of his legacy, we've gone from success is a job in New York City to an artist who was incredibly boundary breaking, barrier breaking. Um, it's just, it's, it's so appropriate that people still go to his gravestone today and leave these soup cans and Coke bottles and that sort of thing, because Andy Warhol was somebody who, you know, was brave enough to be himself and he supported other artists and he experimented. He was, you know, it, uh, in and among the avant-garde. So he was doing all sorts of impressive things throughout his career. And I think we'll end on this last note here, which I think Andy Warhol would very much appreciate. Beginning in 2013, they launched a live 24 hour webcam that documents Andy Warhol's grave. So you can see, you can go online today and still see if there's anybody visiting him at this hour of the night. But this is um, a perfect tribute to a man who created a film of somebody just sleeping for five hours <laughs> because <laughs> this would be a pretty boring film to watch in general, I think. But it's a perfect way to extend his 15 minutes of fame. So we'll end there for tonight. And I welcome any questions or comments anybody has on Andy Warhol. Yeah, thank you so much, Jane. That was wonderful. That was really great. Um, and if anyone has any questions, please direct them to the chat and we'll ask them. We did have a couple of questions that came in. Um, <clears throat> Jenny asks, when she showed the picture of the Byzantine church, mm -hmm. I was reminded of the Cathedral of Learning at the University of Pittsburgh. And you said that he was from Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. yeah. So does she know, do you know, uh, whether Andy Warhol spent any time there or if that was that I'm not sure of um, at the University of Pittsburgh I'm not sure I, I mean Pittsburgh is not that big of a city so no. <laughs> I right. wouldn't be surprised if that's something that he was also exposed to as well so um, but uh, to be honest I'm not totally sure um, somebody said what happened to his siblings. His brothers did outlive him. It was actually his brothers that brought his body back to um, back to Pittsburgh from New York. He, and he also had another brother that um, predeceased all of them who was uh, born prior to his parents immigrating to the United States. So he had these two brothers and um, and I think that they they remained... Um, fairly close because if I'm remembering correctly, one of Andy Warhol's nephews has gone on to become an illustrator. And, and I think he has um, shared and spoken publicly and even written uh, about his experiences with his uncle. So, uh, so I think that there was a, a, at least a, a fairly close connection with, with his siblings. I don't know all the ins and outs there. But um, I would highly recommend if you are very interested in Andy Warhol, um, there are a couple of really interesting Facebook groups that, um, that focus specifically on Andy Warhol. And because, I mean, he lived so recently, or there are people who contribute that know him. And I was just looking through one recently where somebody said, I was the person that, that was hired to go with Andy Warhol on um, university uh, lecture tours. And he said, Andy Warhol hated to talk. I would do all the talking. <laughs> so I just, I, I love getting stories like that. Let's see. Um, yeah, that, that would, that sounds... That sounds awesome. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um, 
one of the soup cans. So Jeannie, Jenny also asked, um, when I visited the museum at the Basel in Switzerland in summer or of 1977, there was a room with several Andy Warhol works. I wonder whether this was a permanent or traveling exhibit. And if you know of which museums exhibit his works currently, like I'm sure that New yeah. York probably has. Yeah. yeah. Um, currently it's, it's hard for me to say, I will say there is a lot of his work out there. Um, I remember when we talked about Edward Hopper, there's not a lot of his work out there. There's only like 300 right. or so oil paintings, but because Andy Warhol was working with a medium where you can essentially create almost exact copies <laughs> of his uh -huh. work. There's a lot of work out there and, um, and there's even, you know, websites um, dedicated to, you know, how can you determine if a certain Andy Warhol is an authentic Andy Warhol. So I would imagine that you could find his work at many museums 